Oftentimes, storytelling or what makes a great story is, uh, at the end of the day, it's the emotion that triggers maybe even an action, a reaction rather. It will trigger something that will lead you to do um, something about it. Some of your co-founders uh, have backgrounds in biology. Are you one of them or? God, this is going to have to reveal how old I am. <laughs> but essentially, uh, we're looking at it around. One thing that happened was I'm really passionate about this. I've invested also time in educating myself. What makes a great photograph? <laughs> I would go down this road. Your global experience has allowed you to direct major campaigns for organizations such as Google Africa, FIFA, World Bank Rwanda, Visit Rwanda, Kevin Hart, Carnegie Mellon University Africa, and the Mascot Foundation. How did you start all these things, man? Holy. Uh, yeah, so that's... Uh, well, just a quick thank you first for having me on the podcast. Uh, I think you're doing an awesome job. Uh, there's not enough podcasts, basically. Uh, you'd be surprised, but um, naturally, as Africans, we're storytellers. So we need more African podcasts. Uh, so I'm pro-podcast. Um, yeah, so how do we get into that? Um, the journey starts around 2010. Uh, a few friends, five to be exact, myself included, uh, that kind of sit down and say, hey, um, we're, we're experiencing the continent um, in quite a different light uh, than what we're seeing online. And when you Googled Rwanda at the time in in, in let's say 2010 or something like that, we, you would get what we call the two Gs, our history, the genocide against the Tutsi and the guerrillas. Mm -hmm. So, but at the same time, you know, maybe that evening you went to a spoken word event, maybe that evening or the next day you went to an art exhibit. And then on the weekend there was a concert, I don't know, somewhere at Amahoro or something like that. So, um, there was a disconnect between what we're experiencing as a country, as a region, and then what was being portrayed online, which is fair because at the time we we're not the ones telling those stories. So that's how we end up saying, Hey, you know what? There's, there's a gap here that we need to address. There's something here that we need to change. Uh, and it was literally one of this sentence that we came up with is change what you see when you Google Rwanda. And when you have five people from different backgrounds, um, we're talking biologists, <laughs> we're talking lawyers, we're talking marketing professionals, we're talking uh, uh, just like visual uh, sort of uh, content creators. Uh, and at the time they didn't have those fancy words. Yeah. So when five friends get together and they set out to do that, uh, that's how you end up. And then what, 13, 14 years later, that's why you end up uh, with a, a range of clients and, and people that you've met along the way. Yep. Yeah. And um, how did your passion for, let's say, visual content mm -hmm. uh, or visual storytelling, let's say, and uh, just the creative industry come about, right? As yep. you mentioned, uh, some of you, some of your co-founders uh, have backgrounds in biology. Are you one of them or? No, it was my my colleague and my co-author uh, for the book. This is Rwanda, Gael uh, Ruaneka van de Weg. But yeah, great question. Um, oftentimes, I think people are always curious how how does this start? How does one get into it? Uh, and my story goes back. Uh, this is gonna have to reveal how old I am. <laughs> but essentially, uh, we're looking at it around 2006. A friend of mine returns from holiday and um, shares photos that they've taken along the way. And I was blown away by the quality. I was blown away by just the beauty of it. Um, and I was not aware that um, there was a way you could create such beautiful images. Because uh, I was always thought, you know, by the time 2006, we're talking those little Canon cameras are yay big with a tiny screen uh, that you can kind of hold with one hand. Um, but then my friend shows me a digital SLR. Right. And he's like, I have a DSLR. And he said it so fast. I said, Excuse me, what's that? Um, yeah, I have a DSLR. So I had to look up what was a DSLR, understand what it does, understand that we had moved from um, film to digital and that now a single lens reflex had become a digital single lens reflex. 
that's my introduction for to, to photography, right? Um, so I said, hey, can I borrow your camera for a couple of weeks? And that turned into three months. I knew I had the bug. That was it. From that moment, I could not pull the camera down, kept it for much longer than I had promised to keep it for, uh, to the point where at what he just called me and said, you know what? I'm going to need that camera back. You're going to have to return it. And I did. Um, and then sort of one thing linked to another. It's convincing uh, family and friends, especially my dad. I said, hey, can you spare a little bit of fun? <laughs> Uh, money, uh, this is an investment. I will pay you back. It's a loan. It's not, uh, <laughs> I'm not asking for a free gif gift here. And then around that time, um, so I'm living in Canada and, uh, it's, it's, uh, I have the opportunity to come back to Rwanda for the holidays. So I found some, it's one of those things, right? Like when you were in the spirit, when yeah. you're into it and you're really passionate about it, things come to you. Uh, so, I ended up getting a few gigs, ended up making, there were around $1,000 at the time. Uh, the mm -hmm. whole camera equipment set had cost me about 650, I think. So I was able to make a profit. I was able to give back, uh, the, the money that had been loaned to me and I was able to make a little bit of extra money and that was it. I did not look back. That really? You paid yeah. back your, your parents? Yeah, I did. I did. <laughs> That's pretty cool. I did. And, and I think that is the one thing, by the way, I, um, as creatives, as Africans, you know, our parents always, hey, and I was studying political science, so I'm expected to maybe be a politician or something, uh, get a serious job. Um, but then when they saw that I was able within one month, uh, a summer holiday, I was able to turn around that quickly and then be able to create something interesting. Uh, actually, I had some of my images also featured in the Run There uh, in flight magazine. So sort of being able to showcase that, hey, you can make some money, you can have the impact where now we're talking about travelers seeing your photographs in the in flight magazine. Um, that gave them a sense of like, okay, this could be a serious profession and there's something here that's, that we'll see. Let's see where it takes them. At least we won't give you the hard time that we used to. So that was, that was a, definitely a shift uh, in understanding what the creative industry can bring. Um, so yeah, that was a great experience. Yeah. yeah. I always feel like um, the best moments or at least the, the most exciting moments for any entrepreneur is the first couple of dollars yeah. that they make. So I want to go back to that moment, right. um, you making that a thousand dollars, right? Was it because you were the best photographer uh, in that region right. where they could find, uh, how did you get from you borrowing the camera, okay. using it for a couple of days right. to convincing your parents to buying you one yeah. and then, uh, make, making that first, yeah. uh, dollar. Right. So, um, I think. Uh, one thing that, um, that happened was by the time I realized that I'm really passionate about this, I've invested also time in educating myself. So, uh, one of the biggest platforms at the time, I think it was owned by Yahoo or not yet was Flickr. Flickr had enough resources. So what you would do is with the camera that you had, with the lens that you had, um, and the, let's say the brand itself, you would end up with sub sort of communities, uh, that had, um, not chat boxes, what do you call it? Like just online communities where people could discuss the equipment. So within that, that was an opportunity to learn. Uh, it was a place where you could ask questions about your camera. Why is it behaving this way? What does this button do? And you get feedback from fellow photographers, right? So, um, this is, there was a seriousness in the passion that was involved. It was not just, I'm passionate, I'm chilling, I'm just going to take a few photos when the vibe is right. No, there was a seriousness where during the day I would try and test out things. And then evening I would sit there in those chat communities and ask questions and get answers and watch videos and really educate and understand what, what is this tool and what does it do? Um, you combine that with uh, sort of a bit of a, at the time, the creative industry, it's still um, sort of non-professional and 
the scene in Rwanda is that uh, when it comes to visual storytellers, uh, you had a lot of foreigners that would kind of drop in because the country is beautiful, right? So they drop in, they say, hey, and they would approach some of these agencies, they would approach some of these uh, banks, you name it, say, hey, I'll do the work for free. Um, and oftentimes, uh, they shot it from their own perspective, naturally, but also they would own the rights to the content um, as much as the visited client would hire you to do something. Uh, so what ends up happening is, I'm there now, a random, a creative, very serious, passionate, understands the context in which I'm operating in, which is my own country, right? So I had sort of all these uh, things stuck up uh, in favor of what I was trying to achieve. And I think people were able to recognize that and say, hey, you know what? We've got someone from here uh, who's able to do something great uh, in an industry that's sort of kind of starting Let's give this person a chance. And then once you get the job is you go full in. There's no half bleeping it, right? Um, yeah. You really have to give you all this. You have to be professional. Um, and even by the time, not knowing what professional being was, but essentially if you gave me a task, I would complete it yeah. and I would do it with the best of my knowledge. And I would explain why I did it this way. Um, so that, that was a real sort of catalyst moment. Yeah. And just someone gives you a chance, run with it, be serious about it, complete it, finish it. Yeah. 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 Um, what, what, what makes a great photograph? Huh. <laughs> Are we going down this road? Yeah. Yes. What makes a great photograph? Um, so it will definitely invoke uh, some sort of emotion from either the person who's creating it or the person who's viewing it. I think that's this. I will tell you all the technical elements of it, uh, rule of thirds, uh, abstract patterns, you name it, negative space, all these things. Um, but essentially they will trigger an emotion in you and you may not have the language to tell me exactly what it is, but it will just create, it's just like music. It's just like art. It's something that, uh, the creative industry is, is, has to do with a lot of emotions. So you'll trigger something in you and you'll say, this is beautiful. Yeah. Okay, cool. Let's talk about that transition from uh, Canada to Rwanda. Yeah. All right. Um, again, I think we were talking about this uh, yeah. before uh, we got on the podcast, but um, you know, we're seeing a lot of young people, you know, everybody uh, grows up and we're all watching U.S. Yeah. Europe, yeah. and we think that's paradise. Uh, we want to go there. Uh, if we get the opportunity, that's where we're going to be. Um, you got that opportunity, but then you're like, I need to go back on the continent. I need to go back to Rwanda yeah. and uh, make stuff happen, knowing that, again, the creative industry here is much uh, slower, let's say, in yeah. the process. People don't understand. Um, what made you confident enough to yeah. make that decision? Great question. Uh, because I think uh, many people might be able to relate in the sense that uh, you could be at a crossroad of something interesting happening. Um, the decision came as a result of there was something in me that wanted to rediscover my country. That was one. Number two, um, without even sort of realizing was that... Um, Maybe when I Googled images, they were not taken by Rwandan. There was always a foreigner's name to it. Um, and those two things sort of coming together and saying, you know what? There's a real opportunity here. There's a real chance for us to tell that story from our own perspective. Huge driving sort of force and reason why um, I went that route. And um, you can say, why move back? It, essentially uh, realizing that you might be a pioneer uh, was something huge. Uh, I think some of the earlier conversations that we had was being able to identify that gap and saying, hey, there's something here missing. We're experiencing this beautiful country. We're driving to Akagera. We're driving through Nyungwe. Um, but those photos are not online. So you realize that, hey, um, there's an opportunity here to really showcase your own country in a different light and 
truly, truly, that was one of the most uh, sort of convincing argument that I gave to myself. Yeah. Um, I didn't need that much. <laughs> uh, and, and then from there, it just kind of rolled really fast uh, because you realize that actually um, a lot of our stories, I mean, even if we go back to our own history, let's say the genocide against the Tutsi, it was documented by foreigners, right? Um, but there was an opportunity with this country sort of turning in 2010, we're now sort of expanding, we're now getting on the global stage, we're now starting to experience different things, but we have to have the image, the stories that match that. And it was important to say, are you going to be there? Are you going to be the one? Uh, so I had real FOMO. I said, you know what, this, this could happen without me and I don't want to miss out. I definitely want to be there when this happens or I want to be part of that uh, momentum. So, and um, also just having conversations with friends who are sort of same age-ish, who are also kind of looking at the continent and saying, you know what, there's something exciting going on. We don't quite just pinpoint just yet what's going on, but we need to be there. There was a, a real sense of something was in the universe that kind of said, hey, you know what? You might want to be in Rwanda or in Africa because things are about to turn. Um, and really, at the end of the day, uh, it comes down to leadership, right? So uh, when you see leadership that has a real vision for where they want to take their people from point A to point B, but not only in talk, in, in walking the walk as well. At the time, I think when I moved back, the convention was a shell. And he was, you know, about to be finished. So it's, yeah. it's the kind of things you could see with your own eyes come back a year later and the convention is finished, right? Like, so you say, hey, you know what? These guys are very serious uh, about what they're doing. Um, so that that was uh, definitely a motivation factor. Yeah. No, I think it's definitely important because um, I think we see a lot of, I have a lot of people, a lot of friends um, who are always thinking that the opportunities are better yeah. out there. But I'm always saying, even for people that I know who are abroad, I'm always telling them, hey, the opportunities are actually here. Because, you know, if you go to the US, what exactly are you going to invent? Uh, you know, even if you do, uh, you're going to have to compete with so many people, 300 million people, yeah. huge market. Yeah. You're not from there. Yeah. You know, you're going to have to go through so many hoops for you to, to even succeed. So yeah. a, lot, a lot more opportunities back on the continent. I do. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you come back here and uh, what do you do? So you're here. I yeah. You guys are now back. <laughs> um, do you say, okay, let me, let me try and get a job and, uh, you know, just get. Yeah. Get so, um, so like I said, uh, by the time I land, some of those conversations have already started. Uh, we've registered Illum at RDB. Uh, how, how did the name come about? Illuminate, right? Illum mm. means illuminate, bring to light. And it still goes back to what I was saying earlier was that um, at the end of the day, we've wanted to uh, change really what you see when you Google Rwanda, when you Google Africa. And uh, so the only way to do that is to illuminate it, is to bring it to light, which is what Illum means. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, we get you know up and running and a uh, very tiny office. Um, uh, by MTN Center at the time, uh, next to our restaurant. So I remember the smells that were coming from uh, next door when the kitchen was preparing some of the earlier meals. Uh, uh, so yeah, the, you go kind of, you know, borrowing a few chairs from friends, that kind of thing. And you just kind of set up a few tables, open your laptop and you have your camera and you say, hey, we're here, we're, we're starting. So um, one of the best ways to really say, hey, we're here, was to actually do the work. So, uh, and this is something that we often talk about with up and coming creatives or someone who wants to get into the creative industry or an entrepreneur, start, do the work. So I remember um, with one of my colleagues, Gael, we just sit in a car and say, hey, we'll drive towards know, Akagera. And along the way, we would stop and take photos of all those things and document the, the country that we saw that was experiencing so much change. And you come back and you post it online and you make noise about it and you send it as far as possible. Uh, and that kind of 
slowly people started understanding, for example, the power of photography. Like if you, if, if you Google Rwanda, if the reason why people uh, are coming here, other than the leadership and all the things that we're doing is, is at the end of the day, you need something that you can show, right? People are seeing the beautiful images uh, of Yungwe, of Akagera, of the gorillas, of people having fun at the BAL, you name it. But at the end of the day, if you don't have those visuals, then how are people coming this way? So with that, slowly, uh, we had a Flickr page posting photos. People were really interested in uh, to know and to to discover the country and, and that kind of stuff. And uh, yeah, that got us sort of the ball rolling. It takes one client that takes a chance on you and slowly but surely you start building yeah. and educating especially because a lot of the times um yeah people didn't quite understand what we we're trying to do uh, as a communication agency yeah. yeah what was your first client i think it was, was mtn an actually it might have been mtn yeah. yeah yeah what was the project and how did you get them uh, it was how do you convince frontends to go on twitter um yeah that could this is 2000 10, 10, 11. Yeah. 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 So at the time, um, so what's ha what happened was, um, the president went on Twitter. The president started interacting with Rwandans, Africans, diaspora, you name it. Uh, so there was a rush of some of these institutions, government agencies, ministries, ministers started going online. I remember at the time there was even a, a minister of health who had like a meet the minister on Tuesday, things like that. You could ask any questions that you wanted on Twitter. Um, so MTN have, was kind of creative in a way that they had to figure out uh, one ways to get people to go on Twitter. And um, at the time you could send an SMS as a tweet. You send it as an SMS and it comes out as a tweet on your page. Oh yeah, I think I think, I think I think I know that. So that's that's how way back <laughs> we go here. <laughs> I, th I think we know uh, your so age. So there was a whole now. campaign on that. Uh, I think we know your think, age now. Yeah, oh boy. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, that was one of the yeah, most interesting the first one. Like, the end. That's good. Yeah. Um, tell me a little bit about your book. Uh, this is Rwanda yep. that uh, your company released. Yep. Um, what was the inspiration there? I think um, you kind of touch on it, uh, yep. just documenting what the country is all about. What do you think has been the impact of uh, the book, either in Rwanda or even for the diaspora that is outside? Right. Um, so by the time we do a whole book, there's a sort of a series of events and things that kind of lead you to that. Um, we started, you know, like I said, for fun, driving around the country, um, uh, showcasing the different sort of facets of this country, the different areas, the different animals, the different plants, the different, um, there's also, um, at the time we're, we're creating things like Dinah en Blanc, which, uh, when we did it, uh, through our license, we're the first ones to hold Dinah en Blanc on the African continent. Um, so when we brought Dinah en Blanc to Kigali, that was also an opportunity and a way of saying, hey, um, there's, there's multiple ways to enjoy yourselves. Uh, there's different ways of thinking about it. So uh, a, a picnic where you get to dress up in white and it's a secret location and you have to pay in advance. Trust me, convincing Rwandans to pay ahead of time and they don't know where they're going. Uh, that was a big gamble, but it paid off. Um, so all these things are happening. The, the dome, um, I believe at the time is just about to finish. Uh, Rwanda is expanding so fast that, um, there's now, our uh, helicopter services, uh, helicopter company, and they're realizing that a lot of their, uh, content is actually from the ground. And they said, Hey, uh, we'd like to fly you guys, um, towards the north. West, so towards, uh, you sort of start from Kiwi and work your way up around the lake, Kisang, excuse me, and come back down. So what ends up happening is, um, on the flight back, uh, Gail and I are looking at the photos and we're like, whoa, this is really interesting. This is quite a unique perspective that no one has shared just yet. And that kind of triggered something that says, you know what? 
there's a real opportunity. You've done the work on the ground, but now you're about to take a whole audience of people, be it Rwandans and Africans and all over the world, now to experience the country from a complete shift in sort of where you're experiencing it. Uh, and this was the first time this has been done. Yeah. In, the in, in Rwanda, in, you know, it's been done, I think, by, again, Nat Geo uh, foreigners, right, yeah. uh, who've done this in some of the big countries that have more of like a tourism uh, industry that's older than ours. So we're talking the Kenyas, the South Africans. Some guys have done that. But uh, the real opportunity, yeah, is this to say, hey, now Rwanda is, is developing, is changing fast. Um, you've experienced through the years, and uh, we're talking like six, seven years, uh, around, you know, I think 2014, 2015 is where we start this project. So we return with a bunch of photos um, that we deliver to the clients, but we also re remain with some that we say, hey, you know what? I think we're sitting here on something very interesting. So that discussion kind of led to, we should probably do a book. We should do a book and really try to find all the corners of Rwanda, all the dis different areas that we had experienced through driving, um, through just exploring as a tourist, as a, uh, so with that, we say, Hey, I think we're sitting on, on something very interesting. And, uh, we pitched it. We pitched it to, uh, the MD of a Kagera Aviation who understood immediately. And one of his first questions where we expected a lot of sort of, uh, resistance, he said, how many flights do you need? And we had to kind of go back on the map and look and say, Oh, actually, we really need to identify the key areas. So yeah. Um, after a few, uh, meetings, I think we settled to around six, seven, eight flights. Um, naturally helicopter have long flight time. So anywhere between two hours to four hours, which means you cover quite a bit of ground. Um, uh, and yeah, so that approach was, it's, you need people who believe in you. You need people who understand these things immediately, but also by the time we're finishing or, or really pushing to finish the project, right? We're, we're talking 2017, 2018. We've been in the game for eight years, right? And we've shown what we're able to do. People know our photos. People appreciate. Um, and at the time, for example, the, uh, the, so it's around the time the convention is, is, is ready. Um, uh, I think there's an African Indian meeting as well. Uh, so one of the flights uh, was to capture the way the uh, the dome changes colors. So we did those shots. Um, it was a sort of late afternoon into early evening. So you've got the sunset plus the dome, and these photos went viral. Yeah. Once it went viral, we had something there. Um, it was a lot easier then to even find investors and convince them that a book, a coffee table book that almost weighs three kilograms. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it's quite heavy. Yeah. It's quite heavy, <laughs> uh, but we did cover quite a bit of ground. And, yeah. and by that time, people understand that this, this is something uh, of value. This is something that you can give someone. This is something memorable. We're, we're documenting the progress of this country. Uh, so that was, that was a huge uh, moment. Yeah, for sure. And uh, do you, how do you think it um, kind of like impacted you as a, your business, you know, in the long run? Yeah. So, um, the way it impacts, I think is, um, on a wider audience, when we're talking about the creative industries for people to understand that now, um, you have a sort of high value, high level book, uh, executed, done by Rwandans for Rwandans for Africans for the world is I'm telling you, Hey, young lady, young man, if you ever want to do a book about something, it's possible. And I'm showing you what it looks like, right? Um, so at that point, um, you've unlocked something there in the minds of, of the creatives and everyone's sort of saying, okay, all right, so it is possible to create something that looks like that. Um, now, try to imagine how many people have seen this book try to imagine how far it's gone. Um, we've had people buy it from Japan, from San Francisco, from you name it, right? So now what you've done is you've taken the image of Rwanda and you've 
exported globally. Uh, uh, and it's now people can talk about your country that can trigger someone to come and visit the country and say, you know what, I got this as a gift for Christmas. I'm really curious about this location. I've went through the book. It's magnificent. I'd love to visit. Yeah. Um, what it did as well was, for example, one of our colleagues that had started as a graphic designer, uh, this uh, lady named Denise Suera, um, started moonlighting as a photographer, started watching over every move. And she would you know, reach out to me and say, hey, can you help me understand the camera? What are you trying to do? All those things. And uh, hey, Gail, wh why are you shooting it this way? Why is it in color? Why is it in black and white? So slowly, uh, we're having this conversation and then it's like, you know, it gets to why are you doing it to now, can I borrow your camera? Um, which took me back to my days when I started. So I said, absolutely, you can have it because you can kind of see the potential and what it can trigger and, uh, uh, and mean for someone. Um, she ended up finding a story that was very close to her, um, understanding, um, one of the world that her mother had operated in her, her friends, which was the women uh, who plant and harvest the coffee. Um, and she ended up doing a whole book that we published uh, on her behalf. So again, you've, you've triggered and you've shown to people. So one of our, actually our second book that was published out of Yume Editions was a former graphic designer turn photographer, turn storyteller, who says, I have a story to tell. So she called it Strong Women, um, um, Strong Coffee from Strong Women. So yeah, you end up with, with that kind of inspiration that leads into now people say, you know what, we can do photography books. Yeah. 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 I, think, I think a lot of industries definitely need mentors yeah. and i think that's that's um what he does you know if you if you're willing to take the risk of saying okay i'm gonna go and i'm seeing this industry does not have a lot of players in it or professional players um, let me go there make it happen you know you become kind of like the you know, the person that everybody looks up to and say hey yes he's been able to do it so there must be something uh where they can tell their parents like hey you know, uh, <laughs> it's possible. And, exactly. Yeah, and he was I, it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm, I'm, you know, that would, that would be huge. Uh, I, and I hope somewhere as some kid, I mean, I, I would be totally honored. I hadn't even thought of that, but it's, yeah, I guess it's possible that some kid out there is like, Hey, here's a book done by Rundan. I'm a Rundan. And wow, that would be huge. Yeah. yeah. Um, what makes a great story? What makes a great story? Uh, so oftentimes storytelling or what makes a great story is, uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's the emotion that triggers maybe even an action, a reaction rather, uh, from someone. So, uh, you'll hear it, it will invoke something in you, anger, happiness, something, and do, it will lead you to do something. So you either cry, you will look it up, you will research it, you will run and go figure out if it's a product, you go buy it, touch it, feel it, whatever it is, uh, it will trigger something that will lead you to do um, something about it. So that's, that's usually a great story. You will know, it will move you. It will move you uh, through your soul, through something will happen yeah. and you will sort of action it and turn into something. It might even inspire you to create something else, right? Um, but yeah, yeah. And uh, so, so, what's what's the advice there for up and coming storytellers mm -hmm. on crafting stories that can regenerate or yeah. trigger? Yeah, that's the right word. Yeah. Trigger yeah. some kind of emotion. So, how do they go about creating something like that? Absolutely. So, uh, great question because um, it's important to understand that uh, you're, you're reacting to something uh, and you may not necessarily understand uh, where it came from or how it was produced. Um, so, what you end up is um, to be able to, to create a great story, a great 
image. Uh, it has to come down to authenticity. You really have to, it has to be your voice. Uh, there's a lot of, we're bombarded with a lot of content. Uh, but I think if oftentimes you just find a quiet moment and you really dig through um, sort of yourself and understanding who you are as a person and where you are at that moment in time, you'll be able to create something pretty special. Uh, and then if you give it that much respect, it means you will pay attention to the craft and the effort you're putting in to realize uh, that product, that beautiful photo, that song, whatever it is. Um, so if it's authentic, um, if there are elements of collaboration as well, that's a huge aspect that is something uh, we've done uh, when we do uh, events like For the Culture, uh, which was an event that combined food, music, art, um, fashion. When we get people together at the end of the day, they go home and there's, there's something triggered. It's like, I had a good time. Um, and you ask them exactly what was it, uh, but it's a combination and being able to curate and really understand the times we're in and, and finding sort of those collaborative pieces and people really understand and say, you know what? Yes, let's, let's all work together to create this special moment. Uh, I think if you have those two things, even if you choose to work, uh, by yourself, uh, just let it be authentic. Yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, the authentic piece is uh, definitely very important. Uh, there's a famous um, creator on YouTube. Uh, it's called uh, Christo. I think I was telling you about him. You should definitely look into him. Yep. Um, he was talking about, so people come to him saying, hey, I really want to become uh, famous in social media. You know, what do I do? And then, or I want to have a, a, a you know, a, a successful podcast. Like, what do I do? And then he was like, I don't think you should be, you know, I think I, I can't remember well how he phrased it, but basically what he was trying to say is that I don't think you should be trying to, you know, become famous or do these things. Right. You should just try to understand who you are and then share that with the world. Yeah. Right. And then people will, you know, uh, be attracted yeah. to your story or, you know, they will see themselves in you or something will, it will, it will trigger something. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And, um, and that's definitely, I think, when it comes to art and the creative industry, I think that's, that's definitely really important because, you know, we all want to, you know, be, um, attracted by that creator who's very authentic and saying, this is who I am. And I think there's a famous, uh, painter who said, um, just do it for yourself or something like that. Like, yeah. you know, and do it for yourself. Exactly. Stop, stop and do it for yourself. Yeah. yeah. Make, make it really good for yourself and somebody might like it and you should be, um, doing that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So you've worked with major brands. Yeah. Right. Personalities, companies, FIFA, you know, I mean, the list goes on, man. Um, and, what, what's the what's the process of working with these uh, brands or people, right? I think you've also done a project with Kevin Hart. Yeah. You've done a project with uh, the president, uh, Paul Kagame, as well. Um, most of these people we know, they have a huge team behind them. So how do you approach these kind of projects? Do you go in saying, hey, I got 15 years of experience. I know what to do here. Um, you know, it's my way or the highway. Yeah. Um, or do you go in and say, okay, how can we collaborate? Or then you say, hey, what's, what's the story here? Yeah. Like, what's the process of working with these brands? Uh, I'm a big believer in adaptability. Uh, adaptability, uh, like I said, authenticity. When you know where you stand, it's a lot easier to then uh, not necessarily impose, but voice an opinion that uh, if you've been in the game, some others say maybe they know what they're talking about and we should listen to them. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's a combination of all those things, but um, eventually as well is consistency. Uh, I think one thing that is not talked about it often, uh, especially with some of the younger generations, is you do have to put in the time. The 10,000 hour sort of rule is it's really someone did not come up randomly with that number. Uh, there was, there was the effort. There was the, the constant learning. Uh, I am a constant learner. Um, 
some something that I can admit to was last year, I really learned in understanding flash, um, the flash that goes on the camera. You, so, you know, you're talking 15, 16 years later, uh, but I'm, I'm willing to admit it. I'm willing to do something about it. Yeah. So um, by the time you have, let's say a project like, uh, so we, we got a call about uh, photographing the president uh, as he was being named African of the year. Um, so uh, Forbes Africa had an office here. They have an office in, in Joburg. So they get in touch with us. They say, hey, uh, we're some, uh, you know, the professional photographers that we're looking for. Uh, you have the experience. Uh, can you help us sort of achieve these things? So if I go through the steps is give me as much of the sort of creative brief uh, Pad it with as much details as you need uh, for me to understand what you're trying to do. And um, the brief was very clear. It's African of the year. We want to show joy. We want to show um, green as a background, right? Uh, trees and stuff. Uh, uh, and uh, because some of their covers, if you look, so then we got to like study and understand some of the covers. A lot of their covers are done behind, uh, either in a studio with uh, sort of solid background. So there's an opportunity here to say, hey, we want, he's an authentic leader. We want sort of an authentic look. We want something relatable. We want something very sort of dynamic and simple. Um, so combining all those elements, really, we did a few calls to really understand what they were trying to achieve, right? Um, so then you start picturing and having an idea of what could that look like. Um, Dan liaise with uh, his team here uh, in Kigali, understanding what's possible. Um, we did a quick location scout. Uh, we were able to find that sort of uh, green background that we're looking for. Um, and then understand that you're there to execute. Uh, I think if you stay professional, what ends up happening is, um, yeah, you just do the job as you're supposed to do, right? Because you've done your 10,000 hours. So I know my sets of questions of, of guidance that I'm giving him as we're doing the photo shoot, right? It's pose this way, turn left, turn right, look up, look down. I'm going through these things. Uh, and to me, I think I at some point I forget that, you know, you're dealing with the president of the Republic of Rwanda. Um, but that's because over the years I've sort of worked on my craft and really understanding what does it take to do a portrait. Um, the adaptability was the fact that we had about five minutes. Um, it's understanding that you, you have a very limited amount of time. They're not coming to the studio where you get to, you know, do makeup, hair, talk to the person, get to understand all that good stuff. Um, so you have to execute rather quickly. Um, and just be flexible. Uh, things can change in a minute. Uh, it could happen or not happen. Uh, but we were pretty certain it would happen. Uh, location is agreed upon. Uh, so yeah, comes up, shows up, ready, ready to rock and roll. And he said, what do you want me to do? I said, sir, please stand there, cross your arms, do this, put your hands in your pockets, turn around. We just went through the motions and all of that in, in about five minutes, you just kind of do what you, yeah, you just make it happen. And, um, and then, uh, the importance of sitting down after with the team and debriefing and seeing what you got right, what you got wrong. Uh, feedback is very important. It's very important to hear that kind of stuff, uh, cause it can only make you better. And that's if you sort of cut emotion out of it and just look at it from a technical point or did you achieve the goals that they were intended to be achieved at the end of the day? That's it. So. All those elements you combine it um i think you'd be able to do the job and yeah it was it was all these experiences have been um quite uh, uh life-changing almost uh being able to understanding the, the responsibility that is given to you right to whom much is given much is expected yeah uh so don't drop the ball. <laughs> drop the ball, man. Don't the drop the ball. Industry of Rwanda is behind yeah. you. Um, yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your philosophy as a creative, right? Yeah. Um, so there's there's this. I can imagine there's this big um, conflict that a lot of creatives face, right? Especially when you're doing this 
obviously you're doing it, it, this to make a living. Yeah. So get this client, maybe you're not passionate about what they're doing, but the money is too much to say no to, right? Um, what's your philosophy when those kind of things happen, right? Because that I want, uh, and I want you to touch it, uh, touch it in two different uh, perspectives. Yeah. The first one being, you know, you're getting started, you know, you're trying to, I don't know, uh, pay back your, uh, the loan that you, that, yeah. that you got to buy your equipment. Yeah. Uh, but also at the same time, you're trying to find that uniqueness, that authenticity that we're talking about, yeah. right? Not just, I'm just going to be like the regular, like everybody, I'm just going to take the money, but I want to leave my mark in there, right? So how do you advise or how do you even look at it uh, for yourself yeah. when it comes to finding that balance yeah. between being unique, yeah. but also just making something commercial? Yeah, I can make uh, money. It's 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 a it's a great question because um, I think along the journey of being a creative, you're definitely going to reach that moment where you ask yourself those questions. And um, to me, the similarities about even what's your style as a creative? Uh, why do you shoot black and white? Why do you prefer only color? Why do you like lines? Why do you prefer portraits? Why do you do fashion? Um, finding that voice is crucial. How do you find that voice is repetition, is really spending those hours and crafting and crafting and crafting uh, your work. So as a person, as an individual, uh, you, have, you have to understand that um, there's a perspective the more you do something, the more you realize that's where you're gravitating towards. Um, so over time, things like, you know, establishing very um, sort of important values and understanding that, for example, and you we will not do the sort of, you know, they call it uh, poverty porn content, right? The kids with the flies and stuff, right? There's a, there's a dignity to your human uh, that can be uh, sort of achieved without, uh, there's a message that can get across without really diminishing someone to that level. Uh, so if you have a set of solid values, treat people with respect, treat people the way you'd like to be treated. I think if you have that sort of foundation, then it's a lot easier over time to now demand it, uh, include it in the way you operate. Um, so one of the things that I've enjoyed as well was, you know, uh, my table series because I enjoy being around people. I'm a people's person. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I'm not an introvert, <laughs> but I do enjoy a good conversation and then being able to sit down with someone. So what, what kind of questions would I like to get? What kind of, how would I like to interact with a person? And, and. Basically, your, your, your values are sort of hidden in there. It's in there. It's in there. So um, understand how you want you yourself. You'd like to, how are you experiencing life? From that perspective, um, then it's a lot easier to translate that into your work that you do every day. If you as a person, you treat the next person with dignity, then chances are when you pick up the camera, you will find a dignified moment in them to be able to sort of capture that moment, right? As opposed to at their lowest point or whatever they're going through. So it's really important to you as a person, what kind of values do you have? How do you see the world? And then with time and the hours and the practice, it will translate into your work. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then that up and coming creative yeah. comes back to you and says, Hey, I'm trying to get started. These are the clients I'm getting. I don't, I don't agree with what they're doing, but yeah. I need the money. Yeah. Right. So going back to the advice about the 10,000 hours, yeah. is it by, you know, just sucking it up and saying, yep, yeah, I am nobody. I need to build a name for myself and I'm only going to build it by taking on as many gigs as possible, doing all these things. I can do my creative stuff in the background at home, yeah. but you know, I got rent to pay. I got this to pay. Let me make it happen yeah. while I'm building up my um, portfolio yeah. so that, uh, you know, when I get to a point where I can start commanding, yeah. you know, these kind of things and say, hey, I do not do that. But is it practical for somebody getting started 
to start off saying, I don't do that kind of stuff. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, is that, is that, yeah. is that a smart way of uh, kicking you, off your career? You kind of touched upon it with, uh, uh, in the question, there was a bit of an answer to it. Uh, but essentially, yes. Uh, you can stand your grounds. If your values are that strong, there's certain things you can say no to. Um, understanding that you will not always work on the stuff that you enjoy, the stuff that um, that interests you, especially. Uh, understand that you will do work for others. Um, and automatically, when you're doing work for someone else, they want it a certain way. As long as, again, comes down to values, you're not sort of throwing dignity out of the window. Um, if it pays the bills, if it's decent, do it. Because what ends up happening is at the beginning, yes, you do need to get your name out there. You do need to be able to build your portfolio. And how will you know if your style is is black and white, if you haven't shot it maybe for a client that has aspirate? How will you know if you know, you're interested in portraits, um, if people are not? So you have to build uh, through... Um, moments like that through him. and then even over time by the way what ends up happening is you will clearly define the kind of jobs that you're not interested in and the kind of jobs that you're interested in um but again uh, as an entrepreneur i i've even had the opportunity of having my own camera do it just do it just do the work yeah do the work there's not everything in life is the way we want it to be. It's not rosy. It's not the topics here. You know, you're not going to always shoot music concerts. Shoot other stuff. Film, film other things. Create other flyers. Um, do, what well, do. do what you need to do. If you need to create a flyer for a bank, but you know you, your friends have a talent show on the weekend, do that one because then it will pay for the... Um, you know, Adobe subscription that you have to pay. So at the end of the day, yeah, uh, just just do the work. If it's decent, if it's dignified, if it's, it doesn't encroach in it, any of your values, do it. Just do it because what ends up happening is over time, you will have um, enough of a portfolio, enough of, uh, of an understanding and an adaptability. You will get um, experiences where you sort of get a, a, a sense of what the clients like, don't like, the way they behave. Um, you'll be able to develop that kind of sixth sense over time where even by the time someone sends you an email or says hi to you, you already know if you're going to work with them or not. Uh, yeah. But how how would you do that if you haven't gone through all kinds of experiences? Um, so just do the work, get through it, and then eventually and with time, you will start defining sort of your language and what you're trying to achieve uh, as a creator. Yeah. 15 years in the industry now. Uh, when you came in, uh, there was barely any uh, creative industry. I don't think they, would, they were even calling it that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, officially. True. That's true. Right. Yeah. Um, uh, tell me what, what are some of the things that, um, you know, you've seen change over the last couple of years and, you know, where, where do we stand when it comes to the creative economy, let's say? Yeah. Um, so when, when we're starting Illum, uh, there's sort of two fundamental elements to Illum. There's the, the sort of the agency, the communication agency that basically content uses content creation, uh, and then content market it for, for clients and really be able to use all these tools to tell their stories, whatever product that they have whatever conference that they have, whatever that moment may be, uh, understanding all those tools and, and, and really create something special and memorable for them. As creatives, um, something that we talked about was the fact that you need to create, yes, to pay the bills, but you also need to create for yourself. And at the Loom, we said we have to create for ourselves. Uh, so we were constantly doing all kinds of original content. Um, and one way to do it was to also build a community. I remember, for example, one of the first things that we did was um, at the time, Instagram is blowing up. Internet is far more affordable and available across the country. Remember, we set something like 3,000, was it, or meters of, uh, of, of uh, fiber all over the country, 3,000 kilometers, right, 
of fiber all over the country. But what it did is that it, it allowed people to be on Instagram. It allowed people to be on Twitter and create content. So uh, Instagram at the time had something called an Illum Instameet. Um, Instameet. Um, and we gave it Illum Instameet. Uh, the idea was to bring together like-minded people and say, hey guys, let's just walk around, take a few photos. We have a common hashtag and we'll be able to find that content. And that I remember because a lot of the people that came from those Insta meets um, ended up becoming uh, creative, uh, professional creatives. Uh, some work in even industries of like, you know, they're, they're content creators for, for big brands and that kind of stuff. So, um, we went from that to now, uh, as, as of recent, uh, the, the government acknowledging and understanding the impact of the creative industry, uh, so much so that, uh, arts was now put in the ministry of youth, right? Because at the end of the day, who are the creators? Um, it's, it's, it's the young people and they have a lot of energy and they have different stories to tell and different perspectives to share with the world. And so we've seen a place where when I came in as a professional photographer, someone not understanding why they had to pay a lot of money for the work that I was doing, not understanding the investment I had made, um, talk about equipment, talk about um, software, talking about the hours of studying and studying that were put into uh, seeing that that, that um, uh, is something that, by the time it's combined, there's a reason why you're charging X amount from a place where foreign photographers are coming in or foreign creators are doing this stuff for free. Um, and now you're, you're sort of inspiring, you're, you're training, you're mentoring uh, a whole industry uh, and, and all these people who are kind of coming along and seeing that, that there's real opportunity uh, to be able to make a living out of it. And at the same time, really elevate uh, what what you're creating as as content out there. So we've come in a span of what? So 2010 till about 2023, right? Uh, being able to go from a place where there was nothing to now um, arts being given that gravitas, that weight, uh, so much so that is included in a ministry's portfolio and given that world, you know, the attention that it deserves, right? So CCI is a big thing, uh, culture and creative industry. Um, and it's truly the future uh, in the way to, because there's also uh, what it does is an element of diplomacy in it. Um, I think the creative industry has the ability of, I mean, we, we look at the US as an example, right? And being able to export that many movies and music, they've influenced the way we think about a country. Um, so if we can do the same as a continent, which we've seen, right? We were talking to Davidos, the Burna Boy, all these people who are coming up. But there's also so much more. There's artists, there's writers, there's painters, there's all these people who are inspired by the continent who are doing big things. So let's let's get those stories out. Uh, yeah, it's it's huge. It's huge. Yeah, yeah. And um, I mean, staying on that, uh, you know, let's talk about opportunities, right? Yeah. In the in the in the creative sector. Um, you know, uh, somebody's trying to start a podcast. So it, uh, another person is like, there's too many of them. Uh, somebody's trying to become a musician. How would you ever make it? Uh, so much competition. Uh, somebody's trying to become a videographer saying, Whoa. you know, there's tons of them. Uh, why don't you just, I don't know, go and work for that agency or something, right? Why do you want to become uh, something? So there's this, um, I don't know, misconception, or maybe you can educate me a little bit more about that, where, you know, we have this notion that uh, we don't need another Philip. You know, Philip is there. It's amazing. Great. Why do we need another person? Yeah. So somebody is there trying to get started in the creative uh, industry and is getting bombarded by this kind of feedback by family members, friends, people around them. Right. Um, I want you to touch on What's your advice for that person? But also at the same time, where are the opportunities? Where do you see things that are still untapped? Yeah. No, great question. Uh, and this is something we talked about earlier yeah. before the podcast is things like, are there enough doctors? 
So you could say, hey, there's all these hospitals now. So why, why would I become a doctor? But why not? Uh, yeah. There's still a demand for it. Um, I would say, look, look around you. Look how much Africa now as a creative sort of uh, place uh, of what, how much does it mean to the world? What kind of impact is it having to the world, right? When you have Burna Boy performing at halftime at the All-Star Game in the US, imagine the kind of audience that are discovering, that are tapping into now saying, hey, who is this? Where are they from? What country? Nigeria? Okay, cool. Let me start listening to that, right? Uh, who, by the way, I think run the launch, Burna Boy. <laughs> my dear burn for this, but um, that show at uh, Inare <laughs> yeah. propelled him. The, the, the Nigerians, yeah. I don't think they're going to agree. But yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we are a continent that has been great at storytelling. Um, sort of if, if you look at the history, just generally across the board, all 54 countries, you know, you talk about Egypt and whatever they left. Uh, behind, uh, we're talking about Tumbuktu and the libraries that they had, uh, the, you know, even in Migongo, by the way, is a, is a way of communicating art and, and, uh, the storytelling through music, uh, that happens, let's say with Rwanda, uh, all these elements, it's things that were already there, but they were kind of forgotten. Uh, we got distracted by what was happening, uh, elsewhere. And now there's a shift back. There's a real sort of momentum in, and pride and dignity and akachiro, which is a word one of our leaders uh, often uh, repeats. Yeah. But there's dignity in understanding what we already have, which is, you know, we're the cradle of humanity. So look around you. Is that story being told? Probably not. Um, so start that podcast. Don't, don't listen to all those voices. Uh, chances are, um, for example, one of the programs that we, uh, we started was African women storytellers. There's a lady who's in a podcast and who's interested in health and, and women and understanding in the context of Rwanda, in the context of Africa, what's happening in that space. How many sort of women focused, health focused podcasters are in Africa? Probably very few. So, not enough, right? My answer is not enough. How, how many listeners <laughs> are there? They will come, right? A lot of them, right? Uh, if you kind of sort of these philosophies of building, they will come. Uh, the internet is getting more affordable. Um, you know, Airtel, I'm not giving a shout out to Airtel, <laughs> but Airtel launching this campaign where everyone now is able to get a smartphone, that kind of thing. Uh, you're getting in a space where, um, even when we started photography, we didn't think people would be able to see our photos online. Uh, but then the fiber was set on the ground and, uh, that led to more companies providing internet and people being able to afford it and being able to discover new work. So. Um, Instagram, you know, free app, that kind of thing. Um, the tools are there, the platforms are there. Uh, just do it. There's, there's probably the, the good thing is actually that then you might be a pioneer, uh, in whatever that moment, uh, that story that you want to tell, you might be one of the first to do that. And that's, that's, that's really the value of it. So yes, become a photographer. Do the weddings on the weekend so you can get your, your money to pay the bills and whatnot. But then the rest of the time, hey, have you showcased a side of our culture uh, that no one has just yet through video, through film, right? So there's not enough. The moment is now. I, yeah. um, hopefully I'll be around to let you know when it's saturated. But at the moment, we're definitely nowhere close to that. You think so? No. I mean, uh, there's this, there's this, um, uh, if, if we, if we can go into practical examples, there's this new influencer on social media who's going around on a moto, you know, like in two different areas of Kigali, yeah. like, you know, just documenting, you yeah. know, what, what, what she, what she went through. Yeah. And th that was very interesting for me. I was like, like, that's really cool. Right. And then the next day, a couple of days, I see her on like new times as being interviewed, like, Hey, how did you stop this? 
And I'm like, I mean, uh, I'm, I'm definitely uh, curious to see where she ends up, you know, taking that. Uh, but yeah, that could definitely be something that, you know, one could say, hey, you just created something. Right. You know, one, nobody's going to say like, you created a camera, you, you, ne- you didn't invent a camera, you didn't invent, let's say, uh, documenting a journey. Photoshop. What you did is that you found your own unique voice and a way, you know, to tell it. And people just related to it. People loved it. And that's what it's all about. Right? Yeah. But what, what, what other examples would you say um, you would like to see, right, more, let's say, young Rwandan crea- uh, creatives, like, you know, tap into that? Yeah. You feel like the spark is really not, you know, is, yeah. is untapped. Like, what's there? I think, so, I think one of the biggest, maybe not secret, but opportunity that's there um, is the fact that uh, people are rediscovering the continent. There are 54 nations with unique stories and cultural elements. So I think anything that has to do with culture, there's an opportunity there to tell a story. So let's say you're taking our traditional cloth of Imishanana and there's an opportunity to remix it, to give it a modern touch. As a fashion person, do it. Do it. The moment is now. The world is turned uh, its attention towards this continent. Um, they're discovering new things, right? Um, there was a time where I was following this Japanese lady who was obsessed with Imigongo, really understanding the history of Imigongo, where it comes from, why are the patterns the way they are, that kind of stuff. Someone from Far East, Japan, having that interest about the Imigongo here in Rwanda. So... Um, you know, how many artists, we take it for granted. That's the thing. It ends up being something that you take for granted. Uh, you'll say, oh, you know, I see it. I'll give it to a friend as a gift, that kind of stuff. But as an artist, as a creative, there's an opportunity for you to take that and extract it and stretch it and play with it and really give it a different dimension and, 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 you know, run in traditional deaths with drummers, um, we're seeing Ruti Joel, for example, as a musician who's infusing some modern elements to traditional Rwandan music. And there's a reason why people are gravitating towards him. There's, you see a, a Bushali who's doing drill. Fine, drill is from outside, but he's saying it in Kenya Rwanda. He's not trying to rap in English, yeah. right? He's, his audience is the young kids here in Rwanda. Every day they go to school, they'll, you know, if they have a little extra pocket money, can go to the ball game and, and, and watch a game. But I'm telling you, they're rapping line for line in Kenya Ronda. Yeah. And it's a drill beat. So find something authentic, I always say, uh, within you, that, that story you really want to tell. But also there's so much. Um, there's an exercise that we used to do um, in photography where you put yourself in a square meter. So one meter by one meter by one meter. And with one camera, you kind of look around and you say, okay, what am I seeing? And what can I capture without leaving that square foot? Stop and look around you. What is something that you do every day, that you enjoy every day? I've seen people, you know, Rwandan coffee is amazing. (laughs) I think we know a couple of creators now who are like really focused on, on creating that kind of content. I haven't seen anyone who's like obsessed with tea. Rwandan tea is really expensive. Yeah. When it reaches the port of Mombasa, people mix it to sort of up the value of uh, whatever other tea that they're selling, right? Um, anything. You, you look around you, um, there's, there's, there's so many elements, so many things that we can tap into. Yeah. Just look around you uh, and then use your authentic voice. And that's why that young lady who has now is uh, how I got to, right? Yeah, is yeah. how I got to somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Because she's not trying to say that in some French language. No, she's singing Kenya Ronda. And she's documenting the way she is. She's not worrying about, does she have a fancy camera? Probably not. She's using a phone. But that voice is why we're all... And, and also, like, do we care? Her. Do we care if the, it's a fancy camera right. with a gimbal, like yeah. with a whole team following you? <laughs> One day, maybe, right? Yeah. So you can turn into a whole production. But at the moment, her voice is authentic. It's the way she sees the country. It's the way she's experiencing Kigali and all these places. Yeah. 
And it's automatic. Like I said, it's, it triggers an emotion in you that eventually you will gravitate towards and it will, you know, you, you keep going back to it. Yeah. 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 I mean, over the last couple of years, you've been able to inspire or uh, mentor a lot of young creatives. What's your approach when it comes to mentoring uh, up and coming creatives? Like what's your, let's say three step or three rules that you say, Hey, this is what we're going to do. This is where I'm going to get you, or this is how I'm going to help you. Right. Uh, solid question. Uh, and one that, um, I think always try to understand where the person is coming from. Uh, empathy plays a big role, uh, in the creative work that we do. Uh, but it's also a value that I think should be spread across. Uh, it doesn't matter what the industry you're in. First, try to understand where the person is coming from. Um, once you've kind of established and understood a little bit of their background, then sort of assess what are their skills. And then from there, combine tapping into that experience that you've had to now sort of create the path towards where you want to direct this person. Uh, but at the end of the day is, are you constantly pushing for that person to really express themselves? You're really pushing someone to dig deep and understand what story they want to tell. So, um, yeah, I think if you, if you start with those elements, it's a lot easier because the technical stuff, uh, the technical skills are there uh, or they can be developed through learning, through practicing, that kind of thing. Uh, but when it's combined now with an authentic voice is why people uh, really gravitate towards you. So um, mentorship for me is something where I will really try to understand uh, what story are you trying to tell? Uh, and I will constitute ask you, you know, why? The, you know, if you ask someone five times why eventually you'll get the real answer as to why they're doing it so um and then from there it's a lot easier to then build from that and just you figure out the authentic voice your authentic angle run with it the technical skills i often say you know what um like we we're saying the young lady with the, with the viral sort of how i got the convention or how I got to <laughs> Atelier <laughs> with your goal recently. Uh, at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's her authentic voice. So yeah, uh, um, if you're starting, don't, don't worry about equipment. That's, that should be your least of your problem. Uh, really figure out what story am I here to tell? Yeah. Yeah. And what story is Philip here to tell? Wow, 15 years of 15 years of experience. Um, no, that's a very good question. Uh, and uh, so there, there's, there's, a, there's an element of beauty. Absolutely. Um, we always say, yes, the content is beautiful, yet let's say the images online don't match that. The, the narratives out there, um, all those things tend to err towards the negative aspect of it. So there's really a search for beauty. I'm constantly looking for beauty, uh, be it, you know, when photograph, this is Rhonda from the air. I'm fighting with all the experiences that I have to really showcase as beautifully uh, or take that beautiful photo. Right. Uh, but also, uh, is it me, which means there's an element of randomness to it. There's an element of Africa in me. Uh, I think those are the things, uh, that sort of, uh, when I do a table series is to, there's a simplicity, there's a beauty in it. Um, uh, but at the end of the day is, you know, is authentic is is what am what are you sincerely sharing with the rest of the world uh, and and I think once I once I get that vibe and that that thing from you or or the thing that I'm capturing then it's it, my work is a lot easier uh, to execute yeah yeah for sure um, what's next for you next um, 
So I think in, to an extent, if you Google Rwanda, the, the, the content is now uh, really interesting. <laughs> so um, thank you Philip <laughs> uh, wow to take credit uh, alone would be crazy uh, no it's it's and, and and it's we've seen so many creators now uh, run with it really um, now it's Africa yeah how can we turn this into uh, Uh, sort of uh, the rest of the continent. Uh, I would, I would love to work with Africans from all over, from Egypt all the way down uh, to South Africa, to the coast of Kenya, all the way to Ghana or Senegal, right? Yeah. East, west, northwest. Um, it's really how can we enable? How can we train? How can we elevate? How can we collaborate? the next generation of storytellers from the continent uh, really helping them find their own voice uh, and then amplify it. Um, who are your top three favorite creators right now? Right now. In Rwanda. In Rwanda. Oof. Oof. <laughs> Oof. <laughs> hey, 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 hey. Right. So, um, music will have to be Semasol. Why is that? Uh, I'm biased because I already did a table series with him. <laughs> But there's an authentic journey that he's had through music where at a time he even stopped and didn't think it was maybe the thing to do. Uh, and then got back to it. And now the sound is original. The way he plays with around with his voice is original. Uh, I remember him telling me that hey, you know what, I can do interesting music and do it in Kinyarwanda. I was like, done. <laughs> um, so that kind of drive and, and really sort of pride and uh, in using his native language and but still make it sound modern and cool. Uh, Semasole is really good. Um, I have to say uh, uh Uh, it's, I might get a beating for this, but the African women storytellers are really, really, really inspiring. So it was started with uh, by one of my colleagues, Anne Mazimaka, and to see the shift, the impact that um, these ladies are, I can almost see what's going to happen, and it's huge. And they come from all corners. Uh, we have writers, we have filmmakers, we have photographers, we have poets, we have podcasters. To see that sort of force being sort of training, sort of given that power, um, you're in for quite an experience and a ride uh, when they come out. So shout out to them. Shout out to... Uh, Anne and John for really leading, and then a lot of the young ladies who are also part of our team at Tindum, uh, also part of the, specifically part of uh, African Women Story Sellers program. And the last one will have to be um, a singer that's killing it right now. Her name is Bukuru. You can, yeah. I know her. Yeah. yeah. I think she's, uh, Not to put a lot of pressure on her or compare it to anyone, but she's our next Cecil Kaede where she has the potential to become that sort of icon. Uh, yeah, she's doing some really good stuff. Yeah. 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 It's amazing. Philip, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much, man. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Thank you for the work that you're doing in Africa, in Rwanda, uh, telling, telling our stories our own way. And um, yeah, wish you all the best, man. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Um, uh, one thing that I will say is massive shout out to you um, for doing this podcast. Uh, it is absolutely necessary. Keep going. And uh, the biggest thing I think for me is uh, being able to give the voice uh, to the creative industry, uh, which you just done. I, I hope I did them justice, but it's to understand you understanding the value 
of what the creative industry can bring uh, to the economy, to the development of our country, jobs, uh, future jobs. Uh, it's huge. And um, yeah, thank you for having me. Absolutely. Thank you, man. Yeah, Appreciate cheers. it. Yeah. Cheers. Yeah.